<coughs> the second half of this class is still in peace and quiet and subtleness. Uh, even though we had a very happy unbirthday, a uh, uh, birthless, deathless day for one of our devotees today. And so we all enjoyed some pineapple upside down cake with an ohm sign in it. Uh, for our break. I hope you all had a break that was equally ecstatic and uh, we enjoyed it all in a sattvic balanced mind in, in the atmosphere of the Dharma that we create here every day at our center and our center up uh, in Pawi Lomalka too. This one's called Kedarnath, that one's called Badranath after the two famous pilgrimage places in India. So um, uh, that has been the way we passed our last 15 or 20 minutes <coughs> and we come back in the second half to talk about uh, work is worship, labor is love, uh, action is Atman, and effort is uh, essence. And any other uh, similarly rhyming or, or connected ways in which we can put together this activity that we're constantly doing all the time, which just basically is called karma. Again, the word connotation for the word karma is sometimes fearful in people's minds. Oh, I'm getting something, you know, something's coming back at me. Or maybe they're thinking, I hope I'm getting my good karma coming back at me. But basically the meaning for karma is just a action. And to put yoga behind it, karma yoga, then it becomes a, a way of mastering action. <coughs> so that you can uh, you can follow uh, the teachings in Vedanta, like uh, it's in the Bhagavad Gita with Sri Krishna here. You see Sri Ram, also one of the earlier incarnation of Lord Krishna, uh, in an earlier yuga, also had very powerful ways in which he put forth uh, the the need or necessity for doing all work as worship. Uh, but that was, of course, in a country that had been raised in the Dharma. Uh, that can't be probably emphasized enough that that um, uh, a conscious way, a conscious Dharma, would be um, would be to um, would be enjoined upon a culture. Like we were talking about that at the break. How uh, how to raise children from a very young age to be conscious of their actions and careful of how they do, you know. Uh, and you can reach out for something and just cause an error right there and hurt yourself or uh, go out in an unbalanced state of mind, as we were saying in the first half, and run into some real problems because you're, you're reckless and not conscious. But to be quiet, withdrawn, many of the uh, points that were here in the boxes of our four yogas that we looked at uh, at the beginning of the first half, to follow those, to have them noted down and follow them each day as a way of practicing it, to reminding the mind of it all the time. <coughs> like I said, being called mindfulness and and so forth. In Zen, you, you would actually practice that as a part of the Zazen retreat. You would okay, now we get up from our meditation and we very consciously go to the eating area, we very consciously pick up our one bowl, we very consciously take our food, and in silence and consciousness we go sit down and take the food. It's all done very, very consciously and on purpose consciously. And so that's supposed to teach you, you know, there with the Roshi, and you're doing that Zazen practice maybe for seven, eight days, then you go home and hopefully you, some of that follows you. Uh, you don't just go back to your old life and say, oh, I practice mindfulness for eight days and that's it. <coughs> uh, so it, it becomes, begins to become a part of your, the way you act daily. And so you'll notice that about illumined souls or about advanced practitioners, that they very much are, are, um, are imbued with, with this, this uh, uh, way of, act, of acting without acting. And it's put very well here, although I mentioned it at the beginning of the first half, and um, it what? Glare. got glare on it, we see. All right, well, I've got my own version of it here, so I don't need to see it. But hopefully that got rid of the glare for those of you looking on. 
And um, I mentioned in the first half, as I said, the three grades of karma. And the words there, it is needful to discriminate action, inaction, and forbidden action. Uh, mainly as a non-dualist, because I'm a devotee of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa and a follower of Vivekananda's work here in the West, spreading the Vedanta to in America and Europe and so forth. Uh, so I look at that right away and I would want to jump to inaction. Uh, there's another way of um, speaking about it, the four types of karma that Sri Ram talked about. And he said, um, there's black karma, there's white karma, there's gray karma, what he's called mixed black and white, and then there's colorless karma. So both Sri Ram and Sri Krishna kind of if you want to know about karma, you really go to India for that. The dynamics of karma, the types of karma, the colors of karma, the grades of karma, I mean, all of those are strewn about the scriptures of India. And uh, in this day and age, just like Swami Vivekananda has brought together those four yogas for us to, to look at, that themselves were all strewn through the ages, through these various scriptures, some of them non-dualistic, like Avaduta Gita and Ashtabhaka Samhita and, and uh, some of the uh, Upanishads, uh, all the way through to some of the more qualified non-dualistic scriptures to the very dualistic scriptures, all the way to the codes of morality, like of the code of Manu, they call it in India, how to act on the moral level. Uh, all of these were there in India's Dharma for time out of mind, and they are uh, the eternal version of that in seed form in the Word, as we learned last weekend. That just needs to be watered to come out every age. It's protected from decay. It's the eternal undecaying abode. Uh, you're back there with your own wisdom, and you're undecaying, and it's undecaying, and the land you're in is undecaying, and uh, uh, so you, you've transcended those f five to six transformations they talk about, birth, growth, disease, old age, decay and death. As you get older as a body, uh, in your body, y you, ha you have a period where you're facing off with decay. You're seeing everything start to uh, break down. And uh, you should be able to do that, noticing it with detachment, and almost uh, as a cosmic joke, you see. You could, you could play it against your ego. See, you're not so eternal, are you? Humble yourself and, and let's, let's come, O oh mind, as the song in India says, let's go and dwell back in, our, in your own abode. Uh, come with me and we'll go to our own abode. Be beautiful songs in India that explain this. So uh, the three grades of karma listed here that I mentioned in the first half are V karma, what's forbidden. If you want to put it in terms of what we looked at last, the last chart we looked at, you'd think of that karma which is not scripturally, not scripturally ordained, or the way it was put there is scripturally ordained. So this is an over cover all term then about V karma. And then y you have uh, self motivated karma. This is a second grade of karma. This is very well outlined, very well put. And if you are interested in karma as yoga or neutralizing karma from past actions, or even from this present life, you're trying to get rid of, rid of uh, and free of certain weights you feel upon yourself, psychologically, emotionally, philosophically, then you will pay close attention to this and, and look at these first two grades of karma. And you'd see that getting beyond evil to good is not a solution. Staying in evil is worse, no doubt. Let's look at it. First acts done out of anger to inflict violence. And that's tamas. That's, that's how doing work in slothfulness or in anger. Uh, you might say it's kind of rajo tamas or tamo rajas. It's got activity in it, but with completely the wrong motive. It's, it's inferior even to self-motivated works, where at least you're maybe trying to do good, even if some of that good turns into acts of good stupefaction, as Lord Kapila would tell us, Kapila, the Samkhya system. So um, this is uh, preaching to the choir, I'm, 
I, I'm aware of that. Ignorant actions done at an inauspicious time. That's an open door for karma. And Krishna will explain that in the Gita. You know, they, they, know, they know not how to give acts. Uh, give gifts, sorry. They know not how to act, how to give gifts, uh, how to do sacrifices. They're doing it randomly all at the wrong time. So you could be, say, a priest and not be aware of the divine, the, the uh, celestial calendar and be trying to do actions at the wrong time. And there was a story Sri Krishna told about a man who found a deserted temple. So he said, oh, I guess I'll maybe become a priest. I'll open this temple, ring, uh, blow the conch shell, and people from the village will come. So he did so at dusk. And the people from the village heard this conch shell and said, wow, somebody must have opened the old temple. Let's go. So they all went to the temple, you see. And when they got in, the floor wasn't swept. There was still moss all over everything. Leaves were on the, on the steps, cobwebs in the corners of the temple. The deity hadn't even been cleaned and set up right. And so they looked at him and said, you know, you can't just pretend to be a priest and open a temple that's not clean. You have to do all the rituals that prepare this for a place of holy worship. Well, there's a perfect example of that acts done inauspiciously at the wrong time. Uh, so Sri Ramakrishna had that uh, story f f for that, which is a very good uh, example. Now, perverse actions committed against the Dharma. Also, actions done out of guile and hypocrisy. Sri Ramakrishna loved guilelessness. It's a word they had to, they, they had to uh, coin, as it were, from the English language to, to express a Sanskrit word guilelessness. So guile, what is that? You know, it almost sounds horrible, like something caught in your throat or something. So uh, <coughs> basically there's this, this um, uh, hypocrisy that's going on that's, that's exacerbated, you see. And uh, so you're going ahead and acting, even when those things are, are clogging your mind. And <coughs> so the action, the, the result of that action is going to be forbidden. Uh, it's going to be painful because it's forbidden action. So they're pretty clear. This, in this case, when Ram gives the teaching in the Ramayana and Krishna gives it in the Gita, they're very clear about what not to do, what to do, what not to do, and uh, how not to do anything. <laughs> the, the last part of that's not going to make sense to most people. They're going to say, what not to do, I understand. What to do, yes, I understand that. What do you mean? how not to do anything. You mean laziness? No, no, that's getting back to forbidden action and, and violence and everything. You know, uh, make sure you put, you, you put the, idea, the word inaction in the category of meditation, formlessness, samadhi, and uh, words of that, of that kind. Uh, so it may be um, obvious, and I may be preaching to the choir, but isn't that very informative? to us uh, uh, when we're facing a world like this. We, that maybe we need to be reminded uh, when politics and armies and creation of missiles and nuclear war and all these things, uh, and everyone's going about as if that's just kind of the natural way of thing, maybe we need to look back and say, that's forbidden action you're doing there, Mr. President, Mr. General, uh, Mr. Leader of the people, See, maybe that's forbidden action you're doing there, and I'm not having any part of it. Um, I've been saying since they first commenced it, I'm against it. Who said that? Marks. Groucho Marx. <laughs> I've been saying since they first commenced it, I'm against it. So that forbidden karma should be obvious to us, and probably is. However, it's good to be reminded of it in a world like this, that acts of, of good stupefaction and acts of bad stupefaction, actually they masquerade as each, for each other. They all not only masquerade for each other, they actually represent each other. Because what's bad will turn good and what's good will turn bad. You just leave it enough time to see, to see that come about. It's very true. I, again, why you want to get over both vikarma and karma and get to this beautiful resting place, this place of the peace that passeth all understanding, 
called a karma. We'll get to that. If that reminded us of things that are going on in the world that we should be aware of and conscious of and careful about, then self-motivated karma is even more subtle. Actions performed with self for selfish reasons alone. Action done for reward or out of expectation. M much of this I've already commented on in the first chart. Actions which are attended by attachment, uh, as opposed to what? Actions you do out of detachment. Detachment to what? A desire for the fruits, for instance. Um, uh, so that you can teach yourself and the ego inside of you how to hands off everything. To do the work, to that you have the right, but you do not have the right to the fruits, see, as Krishna puts it in the Gita. Again, a very hard thing to learn for people who have been raised otherwise. Actions engaged in for glory, honor, and power. That buffers up the ego really well. And of course, that's, that's the asuras, or in this day and age, it would be called these fat cat military beings and, and others who are, are violating the law of nonviolence which should be a pat law, which everyone understands, and you should not go to war at all, if at all possible. Uh, and uh, if absolutely necessary, you should go there with some honor and uh, some right intention around it, like Krishna did with Arjuna in the Gita, when we realized that Krishna was not a part of either side of the war. He just drove the chariot for, for Arjuna. so. He was a detached witness of that war and of other wars and any wars to come. That's the no side that God takes. You see, uh, if God even comes into a form, which we say we think He does in the case of incarnations and avatars, uh, they are completely neutral around all matters because they know about a karma. They know the bliss, the peace, the love, the compassion, and the balance of being completely neutral in all matters. Uh, and they know that based on the fact that these cycles of war and suffering have gone on ever since the idea of creation came to mind, to the great mind, and ever since uh, the concomitant and attending idea of destruction followed it. Can't have creation without destruction. And uh, so, uh, you would understand then some of these great beings like Mahatma Gandhi and, and how he dealt with the problem of violence, the English being in his country, and how others dealt with it too in India. Um, so this attachment needs to be rooted out and detachment needs to take its place. If you took that into a karma, selfless action, then that would be called witness consciousness. I am now the witness of all phenomena that's going by. Before I was caught up in the river of phenomena, I, everything was so serious to me, I took it all literally. I was actually a captive of the river of time and its currents. But then I got out on the banks. Who am I talking about here? Lord Buddha, Buddha. yeah, get out, don't go with the river, get out on the banks and watch for a while. So that river is really time. And that time really means cycles of samsara, which beings are going around and around in for countless lifetimes uh, in this dream of life, which uh, has uh, the eternal hellfires as a, as, a, as a part of its dream, you see. <laughs> Hopefully you'll wake up from that and see that it was all unreal. So this action engaged in for glory, honor, and power, uh, it repulses me. That's a quote from Vivekananda. It repulses me because uh, they're talking about nowadays holy war, and it's been attributed to the Muslims, unfortunately, but it's in every culture. This idea of a holy war was in Christendom before Islam. It was in Judaism before Christianity because the, the Jews went to countless wars and fought and killed. The Old Testament is full of that kind of description. So this holy war is not only in every religion, <coughs> it's in every political body. 
and it's in every individual mind. So it has to be rooted out there. The, the devout Muslim roots out the idea of a holy war completely from the consciousness, takes it out of the culture if he can. So, and this is the family of the faithful, you see, that, 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 is, that are the tariat, that are the, uh, the family of the all-compassionate Allah. Uh, so, uh, which, whereas as it looks like Islam might be the most violent religion, it's probably exactly the opposite if you look at true Islam, full of peace, full of non-harming. And uh, so this has to be experienced by the individual, by uh, becoming a dervish or a Sufi or taking hand into that uh, youngest of the world's religions that's still vibrant, that's still attached to the earth that is attached in a good way. So it repulses me, this idea of, of power struggles and war, holy wars especially. That's a contradiction in terms. Uh, I can go on and on about that, but I won't. Beneficial action abandoned due to difficulty. That's what I was trying to explain in the first half. You see that you must follow through with work uh, and do it to the best of your ability, even if it goes sour during the course of your action or if it fails at the end. If you have that detachment, then you will not suffer the results of it. If you're attached to it, it'll drag from birth to death and death to birth the soul. That's a quote again from Swami Vivekananda. Let's go on with the teachings of Ram and Krishna here and look at a karma because that's the one that's uh, that attracts my attention uh, because I'm preaching to my own choir, choir when I talk about the other two. This is the one that's colorless. This is the one that's most specific. This is the one that I saw in my guru, Swami Yasheshanandaji Maharaj, and whom he saw in Swami Turiyananda, Swami Brahmananda, Swami Shardananda, and Holy Mother in his own life, and which kept him uh, peaceful and centered when Japanese bombs were falling in India when he was uh, the, the uh, teacher of young boys there at the boys school where I visited and saw his little hut he lived in. So he kept him very peaceful uh, and uh, he just pulled out the Gita when these bombs were falling and read it to the little boys. You see. So a karma selfless is doings devoid of design and desire. I like all those D words and they put together like that. Doings devoid of design and desire. You don't have any desire for the outcome and, and you don't have any design for them to go in a certain way according to your own ego's uh, dictation. You see, There's another nice D word for there. Doings devoid of dictated desire and design. You see. Uh, or let's put divine on top of that. Divine doings devoid of, no. <coughs> so that's one very important point. Another is acts successfully subjected to the fire of yoga. My all-time favorite, you see. Uh, it's, it's very similar to don't do acts in restlessness and in slothfulness because those will result in karma coming back at you. And you'll never know when it's coming back with you. It has a shelf life, you know. And so it's going to come back at you at, and come cropping up at the least possible time, uh, at the least um, uh, desirable moment in time. That's why you hold to the Dharma, you keep holy company, and you have a teacher. Because when this karma is coming around, if you're in the Triple Gem, call it also Tripura Sundar, Mother's Triple City, then those things will come at you and they'll be like boils that get lanced at the proper time as compared to boils that get lanced before they form or after it's already too late and they're infected. It's one of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings about the doctor lancing the boil. So it works very well in this context. You want to wait till it's just right. That means when the karma fructifies, when your teacher's there, when you're in the midst of the Sangha and when you're learning the Dharma. If that karma comes at that time, it's a pinprick where a sword was about to fall. Sri Sharada, Holy Mother, told us that. 
uh, a pinwheel prick, at least, where a sword was destined to fall. So she's talking really about saying the name of the Lord on the mantra and how it diffuses karma that's coming at you, as compared to not doing the mantra, not being initiated by a teacher, and not knowing the Dharma, which is all inside of you and hasn't been accessed yet. Then your karma comes at you. What will you do? Where will you go? So I love that, and Vivekananda loved it. The fire of yoga, he said, nothing can touch me. I have the fire of yoga. Right? Acts engaged in while thinking, I do nothing. Right? Acts engaged in while thinking, I do nothing. As a, you might say, uh, a nice way of putting that musically, if I can find it here, um, real quickly. Acts engaged in while thinking, I do nothing, is like this. Shakale to maricha, icha maitaratumi, tomar karma, tumi karma, loke bale kariyami. Panke bar kar kari, pangure langa o giri, kare do ma brahma para, kare kar ado gami. Ami jantra, tu mi jantri, Ami gar tu mi garani, Ami rata tu mi rata, Jemni chalo temni choli. Shakale to maricha, Shakale to maricha, Shakale. Oh, you might say Sri Ramakrishna's favorite song. He just loved that song because it really uh, epitomized his own uh, consciousness, his, his, where his mind was in this, this state of akarma, of, of non-action, of inaction. Uh, so it says here, O, o Mother, you cause all to happen by thy own sweet will, Icha. Truly you are the self-willed one and really the savior of all beings. All work belongs to you, others only call it their own. That first verse. Then he goes on to say, you trap the powerful elephant in the mire but cause the blind man to scale the highest mountain. It's like, how do you do that? You see? On some you bestow the highest bliss, others you hurl into the world of suffering. That's according to their karmas. Oh mother, I am the machine, you are the operator. I am the house, you are the indweller. I am the chariot, you are the charioteer. I move, oh mother, as you move me. I act as you act through me. So you can see how Sri Ramakrishna would hear this, and you probably would hear one or two lines and go into samadhi. He'd come out and say, would you finish that song, please? Well, actually, we finished that a long time ago. Sing it again. Sing two lines, go into samadhi again. <laughs> so it put him in a very high state. And uh, that state, of course, if we study the Raja Yoga, is that perfect concentration leading to detached meditation, leading to samadhi, which really is your own blissful, true nature. It's not something you're going to attain in the future. It's something you have right now. So how are you going to become aware of it? Well, a good starting place is to turn all your work into worship and labor in love, uh, especially in this world, the Bur Loka, which is attached to your ancestors who have desires for rebirth and where work is what they're doing to get certain things. 
Don't you think the ancestors are interested in power and glory and fame? Because that'll make them more money. It'll get them more pleasures. It'll help them own the world. How can you own something that's not real? That's what the seers would say. See, It's like trying to hold water in your hands. Anyway, ho-hum, right? All of that while thinking I do nothing, you see. Then, actions free of hope and desire for possessions. I already commented on that in the last two sentences. Actions done by the mind steeped in wisdom. Beautiful, huh? And if you do everything in your own knowledge, then it's all going to come out as a manifestation of your own knowledge. Finally, work undertaken for the sake of sacrifice. We started out the whole class with that first quote on the other chart about how sacrifice of knowledge is the highest sacrifice. So do that unto the Lord. He says here, the threefold action, fruits of action, good mixed and evil, accrue after death to all who are attached, but no karma attends those who renounce. So the beauty of renouncing, even if you're a householder, see, I'm not going to renounce the actual objects. I'm not going to renounce my wife. I'm not going to renounce my family. I'm not going to renounce my work um, in the old style sense because I'm a householder. So how, what am I going to do? I'm going to renounce uh, everything but the Lord in them, you see, everything but the essence in them, and go on serving until I can cling to God with both hands and not just have to balance like a householder does. Uh, one with the other. He's going to have to worship his ancestors. He's going to have to take care of the family and the children. He's going to have to do works. So karma as yoga would be the route for a soul like that. According to Sri Krishna and Sri Ram, Sri Ram whom we like to sing to too. Sri Ram Chandra Kripal Bhajaman Harina Bhava Bayadarunam Nava Kancha Lochana Kancha Mukha Kara Kancha Kara Kanjarunam Sri Ram Sri Ram Sri Ram Sri Ram Chandra Kripalu Bhajaman Harina Bhava Bayadarunam O mind, worship the merciful feet of Sri Ram Chandra, the destroyer of all karma and the destroyer of the dreadful fear of birth and death, whose countenance shines with radiant effulgence and whose face, eyes, hands, and feet are as beautiful as perfectly formed lotus flowers. And they wax eloquent about the beautiful Sri Ram. Isn't that a nice image, too, of Sri Ram? He'll, no, he's not. He's not carrying a flute, so those of you who don't know iconography very well in India will know that if he's got a bow and arrow, you're probably going to be either Sri Ram or Arjuna. <coughs> um, basically, uh, that, that's, uh, although we may come back to it in later classes, we have two more classes of this topic. I, I wanted to use the three grades of karma to uh, transition to this chart, which we very seldom look at, and which uh, has just been recently <laughs> colorized. <coughs> I finally finished colorizing all my charts for that book, Footfalls, of, uh, that we're calling it. So we're going to have that book out probably within months, and uh, all the 322 charts that are in it, like these, all with commentaries, running commentaries, in some 800 pages, it's going to be a very profound and prolific work, uh, uh, all about pretty much qualified non-dualism leading to qualified non-dualism, some dualism mixed in, and uh, uh, the basic teachings of the Indian Dharma put forth in this age, hopefully for the highest benefit of all beings. So if we were to segue to this chart, See, Hanuman there is a, a good example 
of intellects in action and right action. We know that he did everything right to try and rescue Sita for Ram's sake and to battle the various asuras that were railed against Ram. So he's a perfect, a perfect example of uh, a person who's 100% uh, dharmic in action. So I put him there on this chart called the five types of minds and intellects in action. That's pancha karmatmanaha, and you know, atman, the atman, the mind, and karma, how those come together, <coughs> the five types of mind. Uh, there you see it numbered in red letters. If you can't see it very well from where you are, I'll, I'll relate it to you. The first kind of mind is vaikarika, sattvic mind and ego, inclined to do good actions. Two, taijasa, rajasic mind and ego, inclined towards evil actions. Bhutadi, tamasic mind and ego, performing acts of stupefaction. That is, they may, the, the rajasic beings may be doing evil actions and pretending they're good, you see. That's kind of, you look out in our politics today and various things, uh, it, and even in our conventional religious circles and so forth, there's a lot of hypocrisy going on there where people are pretending like they're doing good, but it's not really good at all, or it's just good for a certain amount of people, and it leaves the other out in the cold. And so it's not really altruistic, it's not really universal, it's not really all-encompassing. And it's not uh, just and fair to all beings who have the Atman in them <coughs> equal in quality and in quantity. That same indivisible soul that you get to through a karma that is through actionless works, through uh, is there equally in all beings and all things, and uh, so you're not acting that way. You're, you're not acknowledging that, and uh, your actions are um, either for the selfish ego or, let's say, uh, God bless America, nowhere else kind of idea here. Uh, it's when basically all souls are of one atman, indivisible consciousness. And uh, if we were all to act in that light, then we'd all be probably giving up evil actions and acts of good stupefaction and acts of bad stupefaction. That's the next two. But there's Bhutadi, tamasic mind and ego performing acts of stupefaction. This is Lord Kapila's teaching in the Tattva Samasa Sutras. Then there's Bhutadi Sanumana and Bhutadi Niranumana. So you break that third one into two, act, performing acts of good stupefaction and performing acts of bad stupefaction. I've often used a, an example of the man who dams up the river behind his house so his kids can have a swimming hole and feels very good about it. Downstream they're out of water, practically dying of thirst. And so he's done a, an apparently good action, but it's caused this evil that he alone is responsible for. And that's happening, that's, a, that's an act of good stupefaction. And uh, so if he were to dam up a part of the river, dig a channel, make a swimming hole for his kids off to the side and let the water flow, that would be doing an act of good action. Uh, 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 a mind inclined towards sattva towards balance, towards mindfulness, towards consciousness, towards awareness. And uh, in that way, he would be avoiding all types of undue karma coming his way. <coughs> Below that is Pancha Adi Buddhayaha. So we're talking now, where we're talking more about the mind. Let's look at the intellect. There are five activities of the intellect that are needing work by you, you see. <laughs> One is obsessive agency. This is Lord Kapila in a very early time, before, before Ram and Krishna most likely. So uh, the first is Adi Bhuta, obsessive agency, I must do. You might call that the mantra of, whether consciously or unconsciously, of everyone here, 
on this earth at this time that uh, is, uh, is not aware of our karma, of how not to do without doing. I must do. They're driven towards it. I'll show you a little bit about that over here, too. Adimana, prideful agency, I will do. See how it shifts just a little bit. The ego gets more a hold of it. The first is a bit out of des desperation, probably because everyone else is doing, and your ancestors did, and your parents told you that you must be up and doing, and so forth. They never told you you must be up and doing without doing. <laughs> that would have been nice. What was that, Dad? Can you explain that to me? I said, you must be up and doing. No, no, you said up and doing without doing. So if he had got the teachings from my teacher when uh, he was young, then he would have been passing that on to his children. And we would know there was such a thing as action in inaction that accrued no karma, colorless, colorless karma or a karma, karma, a karma. A karma goes with meditation and karma goes with action. Just make them both conscious. The third one here is with the intellect is itcha. We had that word in this song I just sang, basically. It's willful agency. I will fulfill my desires. And they will take the hindmost kind of thing. Remember, so this is pancha adi buddhayaha, five activities of the intellect which are, are, are tainted. Kartavyata is sense indulgement. I will satisfy my senses. These are wrong avenues. These are deluded. These are misdirected ways of using your, your buddhi, your intellect. These shake your buddhi, you know, but you should be keeping your buddhi still. That's a contemporary way of putting it, you see. Don't ever let me touch you doing that again, you see. Just keep still. I will satisfy my senses, uh, a bad thing. B number one, because it's not possible. My teacher used to give this talk every year, once a year, satiety never comes. You cannot satisfy your senses. You're following the boga marga as if you could, path of enjoyment. It'll never happen. Why was he in such a high elevated state? Because he wasn't following that path. He denied his senses. So he said, it's not freedom to the senses, it's freedom from the senses. That's a Swami Yasheshanandaism. My teacher coined that. Do not give uh, freedom to the senses, get freedom from the senses. It's like saying, don't teach your children to have fun, teach them to transcend. They will be in there peaceful. They will know what real love is. They will attract people who really love to them instead of otherwise. What's, that, what's going on out here, you see? Everything depends upon that little shift of mind. So that's a very powerful one. And then finally, Kriya, I will use my senses, sense manipulation. I will use my senses to get things and to influence others. Across the board, though, there's this teaching, Pancha Karma Yonayaha, you know, uh, five causes and results of action. These are more positive, what you should probably be looking for in your intellect. Dritti, resolution of mind, speech, and action. Shraddha, inclinations of faith, such as generosity and fealty. Sukha, actions ladled, uh, uh, sorry, actions taken with expectation of reward and pleasure. That's not so positive, is it? but it's one of those causes and results of action of the intellect. Avividisha, I remember Swami Vividishananda very well up in Seattle before Swami Bhaskarananda came to take his place in, in the Vedanta centers in the Northwest where I grew up. So uh, I was always wondering what Vividishananda met, met, you know, uh, meant uh, as a word in Sanskrit. So I found out later, tendency and action that blocks desire for knowledge. So if you're vividishananda, you don't have that. See, it's if you're avividisha, uh, then uh, you have this tendency that uh, where you desire things, and that's blocking your true knowledge. It's it's actually a very powerful teaching that goes very deep. And there you see vividisha, 
tendency to know matters pertaining to spirituality. So when he was a young brahmachari, what did you like your, your name to be? You know, you've probably asked, well, how about Vivadishananda? I like matters pertaining to spirituality. A teacher once, I heard my teacher once say, you Americans, you really like sights and sounds. You like babies born. You like presidents. See, but we Hindus, we love our illumined souls. So uh, you'll go flocking to those in India. Was, oh, there's an illuminary there. You see, oh, let's go see him. See, and that's what our founder Lex Hickson was always doing with his life. He had plenty of money from both families he married into and so forth. Then he spent his life going around and finding these luminaries or people who are supposed to be illumined, and finding out some of them were engaged in in ideas of good stupefaction, and some in bad stupefaction, and a few of them were actually quite enlightened, thank you very much, or on their way to enlightenment. And that's why he did like some three, three to 350 lectures of, th of these people through the 70s, 80s, and 90s in a program called In the Spirit, which occasionally got called Body, Mind, and Spirit. He even had a television show for a while where he was bringing people on. So uh, we'd like to get a hold of some of those films, wouldn't we? <coughs> so um, this is a way of life to go and find souls that were illumined. Who does it remind you of? Yeah, Sri Ramakrishna loved to do that. Oh, I heard that that, that uh, uh, scholar there, you know, is very enlightened. I'd like to go see him. So they'd take him to see him and so forth. Mahima Charan and others. He'd go and visit them in Bengal and look at their enlightenment and see how they were. He loved to go see illumined souls, go and see, uh, see the Brahma Samaj with uh, uh, its, its leaders, yeah, like Keshav Chandra Sen. Well, uh, actually a, a deep teaching, isn't it, but quite simple to go through, and again, a bit like preaching to the choir with all of you. But uh, you can see how they thought in early India with Lord Kapila there at the helm of the Samkhya philosophy, and his quote here says, there are some 28 kinds of mental and intellectual incapacities, <laughs> like the mind's attachments and the intellect's false views. If one follows a logical mental discipline, as told by the scriptures and transmitted by the preceptor, then all of these can be eliminated. Knowing it all, one fulfills oneself. Then one is not overcome by the three types of pain anymore. This is why we think Samkhya and Lord Kapila was a great influence to Lord Buddha with his Four Noble Truths and Eightfold Path, because the, the different kinds of pains were also uh, proposed there in that system. <coughs> so in India, if you mention Lord Kapila, even if they don't know much about him, he'll get a salute, you see, a namaste, you know, like, oh, Lord Kapila, one of the ancient rishis all, who knew this. And he not only knew all the positive sides of it, he was there in knowledge of the 28 kinds of mental and intellectual capacities. I couldn't find them. <laughs> Where's the list, please? The tushtis and, uh, and, and so forth that are listed in his system. In that one scripture that is left called the Tattva Samasa Sutras, all the other Sampya scriptures gone. That is back to the source, back to the seed, back to the word back inside of him and, and those who uh, f uh, follow him and uh, incarnate as him, his precious spiritual children. So to, follow, to find some of these old teachings, very difficult now in this day and age, but uh, you know, that was left behind. The, the Pancha Adi Buddhayaha, five activities of the intellect, and the Pancha Karma Yonayaha, the five causes and results of action. So and you see where I'm connecting them back to this chart that we just saw. Now, please segue over, uh, because probably this class we're making our way through more charts than maybe it's a new record than we've ever made our way through, all around this very powerful idea of karma as yoga, that we should take our actions and just do it consciously. That's all we need to do. We don't need to believe in God or not. Um, uh, we don't need to, to necessarily be great meditators. We don't need to know what's all in the scriptures. Uh, if we're acting, all we need to do is do it consciously. And there's a few bullet points you can follow. 
that keeps you on the track of that yoga. If we look further then into this other newly colorized chart, you can't read, sorry, it's in the way it says the threefold fruits, the threefold causes, and the five incitements to action in the Gita. <coughs> so there's Krishna on the battlefield with Arjuna. And uh, as a backdrop, this is a piece of artwork I, I saw in India and was able to get a copy of. And uh, there you see what's called nishtam, mishtram, and anishtam. And we've seen that already, right? Agreeable works and their fruits, mixed works and their fruits, disagreeable works and their fruits. It's very much like vikarma, karma, and akarma, only in the effect category. So we're talking now about more uh, karma that's already been done that's beginning to fructify things. Whereas you could have, um, you could have um, attenuated that or truncated it is a good word, if you had have been brought up in the Dharma by your parents who taught you these kinds of intellect. Uh, uh, problems of the intellect, incapacities of the intellect, and the solutions of uh, doing work as worship, or doing work w without any desire for the fruits, or action as inaction. Uh, it's very hard then, if you know karma yoga, not to connect it with meditation and then jnanam, jnanam and jnanam. Seems like they just all go together so naturally. And since everyone is acting, if everyone all of a sudden didn't act anymore, which is, by the way, one of the reasons you're practicing meditation every morning under the advice of your guru, then all of a sudden everything would look more like deep sleep <laughs> and people would look more like light-filled luminaries than like fools knocking about the universe, causing pain to others in acts of both good stupefaction and bad acts of stupefaction, in acts that make you look good because you're engaging in a holy war, later to find out that you lost, you see, <laughs> or later to find out that you won and that was, had a horrible ramification, like, hmm, let's see, let's just pick a couple cities out of my mind, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, that's to our credit. You think we're going to escape the karma of that? And you have to be a part of a, of, of a warlike culture like this, with people who are animalistic? Is that it, 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 when you've got all this, you know, to share, and it's beyond good and bad? So this quote from Sri Krishna, the threefold fruits of action, evil, good, and mixed, accrue after death to the ones who do not relinquish. But there is no karma ever for the wise one who renounces. We had that in an earlier chart, so you can see how it connects here um, with a little bit different uh, English definition. This one was by Swami Chidbhavananda. And he has another quote below here where he draws a parallel. <coughs> Let's wait for that as we look at another five-fold teaching on karma. See, I'm bringing kind of pulling out all the stops, trying to give you the dynamics of karma, the colors, of, the colors of karma, and the types of karma, and the incitements to action, and uh, the intellect and the mind's place in it. So all of this is kind of figuring into this fourfold, th this fourfold mind package of thinking, the mind that thinks, the intelligence it uses to think, and the ego's place with it. See, uh, Karma yoga can be a, then a great purifier. Why, do you, why else do you think it gets you to knowledge if, if it's all happening in the mind like that? And, and you can connect back to that mind and purify that mind. Where will all your problems go then? Where will your problems be then, people ought to says. Let's look then at another layer of this teaching, the five incitements to action. Adishtanam, the body, the firm seat of everything is in the body. Karta, the doer or agent. Karanam, the ten senses. Pritakchestaha, the life functions or prana. And daiva, 
the presiding deity. Now, all of those are a fivefold incitement to action. The presiding deity there, as we'll find out, is the Jivatman. It's sitting there in that fourfold mind with the ten senses connected to it, doing action. How should it do it? See, we've already looked at that. Uh, maybe it shouldn't do it at all. Or if that's not possible yet, it should do it as an offering to the Lord, isn't it? So there are fallback positions if you cannot understand the idea of a karma or, uh, as Krishna says, uh, doing without doing. Those who realize action in inaction and inaction in action, we have to say it this slow and with this emphasis on certain words, or else it doesn't make sense at all, they truly know. See? Those who realize action in action in action in action, they truly know. Okay, got it, let's go away. Mm -hmm. But you have to really flesh that out. Those who realize action is in inaction and inaction is in action, they truly know. Uh, whosoever looks upon the self as the agent, his mind is perverse and he sees not. Is another way in which Krishna puts that in the Gita. His mind is perverse and he doesn't see. He remains blind his whole life and goes from birth to death and from death back to birth again in that same condition. Why do you think so many millions are in that condition right now out there? Is, is that enough proof for you? And you see it in the news and on the TV and everywhere else? So the five incitements to action, again, the body, the doer, the ten senses, the life functions, and the presiding deity are almost like a 24 cosmic principle package that uh, probably this got borrowed from Samkhya philosophy and put in a new way. The quote under there to help us understand is, whatever action a man performs with body, speech, or mind, right or wrong, these five are its causes. So if you want a way of getting at the causes of action that are coming out in either negative or mixed fashion, then you should look at these five and take them to task. It, it's, a, it's a practice that Sri Krishna prescribes in the Gita. It's, it's r somewhat buried, but it's there. You then would meditate on adhistanam karta karanam pritak jestaha daiva, which is almost the sloka itself. And uh, then you would know something that most people don't know. And you would uncover the, the roots of the cause for your action. And you would purify them. And then all of a sudden your actions would be free of uh, incapacities. Like you know, these 28 incapacities that he's talking about here. And 52 inabilities. I mean, that's also in that system of, of copula. Well, how about the threefold causes of action? There's incitements to action, but the causes for action are pretty much knowledge, the knowable, and the knower. Jnanam, Gyayam, and Parigyata, they call it in the Gita. So it gets f finer and finer, the teaching. If you take it in, then if you do know the connection between mind and intellect and ego, then you're beginning to put it in terms, that is, for, for solutions, to finding causes to effects, you're beginning to put it in terms of my own mind, and you're not attributing it to some superpower or some devil. All, all of that's beginning to be erased. You see, oh, this is all my own, should I use a Hawaiian word, kuleana. This is all my own doing, and I'm responsible for it. And if I can take the responsibility for it and purify it, then I can, uh, I can then not only worship God in other beings more perfectly, but I can be an example to them as how to get free of karma. And I never read a scripture and I never meditated to do it, you see. I just followed the teachings of the Lord in the Gita. So to finish up this chart and this first class on karma as yoga, let's read Swami Chidbhavmanamda's nice uh, analogy over here. A parallel can be drawn between a car and a human being. 
well, this is going to be rich. Since basically we're all driving around in cars, <laughs> that's the kind of action we're doing. The body is like the factory. The agent is the proprietor. The wheels, steering, wheel, brakes, clutch, and gearbox are the five senses. Petrol is the functioning life force, prana. The driver is the ego, no doubt, but the jivatman is the presiding deity. So jivatman is an interesting word, the embodied soul. And you would have to say that since he's already mentioned the mind and ego, he must be talking about a higher atman, that there must be a jiva koti and, and, a jiva, and then there must be a jivatman. The, uh, the jiva must be beginning to become aware of himself as Atman. And so that it can turn from jivatman to paramatman, the supreme self. So there you've got this idea of the ego, the purusha, and the Atman, these three selves that we actually looked at last week in the teachings on the word. Uh, purusha was the real individual self. Ahamkar was the false self. But then the supreme self was there too, the supreme purusha, also a teaching given out in the Gita. So in about four charts or five charts, I hope that you've benefited from this presentation of karma as yoga, uh, that is karma yoga. But remember, as you read your notes and meditate on them over the next six days before we, re we meet next Sunday with three or four other charts on this subject, that you begin to think of, of this as karma as yoga, that everything I do is going to be done mindfully, consciously, carefully, uh, in service of God, in human beings, and in all things. So here, let's end with a chant. <coughs> Om Tach Nayo, Om Tach Nayo, Ravrini Mahe, Gatung Yagyaya, Gatung Ye Nupataye, Daivi Svastrastu Naha, Svastir Manuse Bhyaha, Urdvam jagatu bhesajam sangnavastu dvipade sangchatushpate om shanti 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 May we make a sincere and humble offering of the small self into the great self. May we always delight in this offering. May we always revere the Lord and Mother of all sacrifices. May divine blessings be upon us. May peace come into the entire human race. May healing, well-being, and prosperity then also come among us. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us. May peace be unto all. Om Hari Om.